Yeah, so the stuff that Neil's talking about is um, the need, I think, inside a human is the sense of belonging, love, affirmation, nurture. And sometimes those things um, have been weakened over the journey of time because they've been neglected. So I'm not going to go into too much details about that, but basically I want to do some teaching around anxiety, fears, phobies and stress and how people can actually address their fears and phobias in a way that is very practical, that we don't always have to over-spiritualize it. We can just get used to it. And so it's, it's becoming apparent in the body of Christ that people are becoming depressed. Come on, let's just be real. People are despairing. And we shouldn't grieve as those that don't have hope. And if we're in despair, we actually need to repent. It's a repentance thing. Because no believer should be at any point in despair. We don't serve the God of our own understanding, we serve the God of all hope. And as the God of all hope, when we look to him, hope is always going to be activated in us. When we look away from him, we lose our hope. Hope that is seen is no hope at all. But the hope that is unseen leads it to eternal life. So um, stuff like that and people basing their thought life off what they feel. If you feel unloved this morning you're more than likely going to give your thoughts to that feeling and always want God to come through for you until you actually believe first that he does love you based on the sacrifice alone. So all these different kinds of teachings, I want to help people to get a check up from the neck up. Basically, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Basically, grow up before you get old. Come on, you don't want that little child parenting the adult. You may be physically an adult, but you may be emotionally a child. We say, well, how do you know if I'm a child emotionally? Because you keep having tantrums. Come on. I know it's going quiet in here, but you know it's the truth. That's why that joy's hitting you. Joy to... <laughs> Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 says, When I was a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. And so I believe God has commissioned me in this specific arena and qualified me because I've overcome in so many different areas of my life which God has anointed me for this very purpose. I've tasted anxiety, fears, phobias, stress, depression, despair, suicide. I've gone the whole gamut. And so God doesn't just pull you out of something just so you can sit around looking good so that everyone else can suffer. There's only one thing worse in Arabia than murder. It's knowing where the water is and not telling others. So I'm going to reveal to people, show people, take people on a journey that can actually help them grow up spiritually. Let me put it this way. If you don't get healed emotionally, you will not progress spiritually. We have a hit and miss Christianity because we get stuck. Jeff Ben Bondren said that everyone has dysfunction. That's right for the person that thinks they're perfect right now, you do have dysfunction because your name is not Jesus. <laughs> Someone thought that was funny. Um, but Jeff said this, where we get stuck is where we are dysfunctional. You know, the nomos cycle is around and round and round we go. Where we stop, only you know. And that's the first sign of insanity, isn't it? You're doing the same thing, yet you're expecting a different result. So that's my introduction. So I hope when I um, put these...
teachings on that we can actually go a bit deeper. Socrates said that an unexamined life is not a life worth living. We need something much deeper in Christ, in the truth, that's going to set us free completely. And by the way, and I'll finish with this, truth was never designed to hurt you. Oh, the truth hurts. No, it doesn't. The truth sets you free. What it hurts is your pride. That's right, it hurts your shame, this embarrassing self, the part of you that wants to hide. And that's the part that Christ wants to get down on the inside. He wants everything. He wants to bring healing and restoration on levels that we could never imagine. And just about when you think, I cannot change and nothing is changing and I don't know what to do from here, guess who's on his way? The King of Kings. I have hit so many barriers in my journey, I wouldn't have time today to tell you how many I've faced. You don't know what it's like. That's number one when I first went to church. You don't know what it's like. You haven't lived the life that I've lived. It's all right for you up the front preaching about prosperity. What about me? Poor little me. What about the suffering that I've been through? So God actually wants to deal with this victim identity that comes into the church as though it's us and them when really we're all a big family together. So he wants to deal with this unrighteous mindset that we have towards ourselves. that only by faith we are righteous, but we struggle to believe that. And he also wants to deal with the self-righteousness in the church so we can come in the center. So we can believe by faith that we're righteous and we can actually get off our high horse and stop thinking we're self-righteous by what we do and what they're not doing and actually come to a point of humility and you watch revival break out in the church. Just one clap, that was like a golf clap. Give me another golf clap, please. That was wonderful. So I hope that's stirred you up a bit. Well, the message today, which which is really like I I ask the Holy Spirit. I I don't just come up with sermonettes and, you know, try and work out a good message because I can preach the gospel. I really ask the Holy Spirit, like, what do you really want to say at the moment to this particular group of people? And I believe that he wants to bring the message to, today to you about living faith. Living faith. See, it's not what you had faith in. I see, I see so many believers, what I had faith in. Oh, you know, God used me to do miracles and healings and signs and wonders. It was all the yesterday. It's all about what I had done. But the question really is, what are we doing now? You know, they said to me in Harvey Bay, I was down at the markets, and I've seen people cruising around in trolleys and number plates and different things, you know, and uh, I'm down at the markets, and the guy goes, oh, well, Welcome to um, Heaven's Waiting Room. And I said, well, what do you mean, Heaven's ra Waiting Room? What's that about? He goes, oh, that's where everyone comes to die. <laughs> Harvey Bay. <laughs> and I thought, that's a good re but See, honey, that's why I've been telling you, we've got to get out of here. <laughs> he said, haven't you heard it's called Heaven's Waiting Room? I said, where'd you hear that? He said, at the golf course. <laughs> Do you know you can grow old if you're just waiting? Do you know you can grow old if you're not active? You know, faith is active. Faith is choosing to believe when you feel stink about yourself. It's choosing to believe when you're in self-doubt. It's choosing to believe when you're confused. It's choosing to believe even though at times you're overwhelmed. It's choosing to believe when you feel like nothing is going on in your life. 
It's choosing to believe when you're financially stuck and nothing in the natural says that God is going to provide for you. That is living faith in what God says about you despite what's coming against you. Faith isn't having it and then saying, thank you, Lord, I believe. That's not faith. And people think that because they have things that that is faith, therefore I can rest now. No, living faith takes you beyond what you feel, what you know, what you see in the natural, and it chooses to believe what the Bible says specifically for that need in your life. Hear what I said? It's specific to the need that you have in your life. If I said you have faith in God today, then that is generic. It's, it's general faith. But if I said to you specifically to have faith in the, the Word of God concerning your situation, then that gives context to what you need to believe. Faith is not mystical, it has direction. It's directive in nature. Why? Because it's specific in nature. God is not just saying for you to believe, He wants you to believe in the specifics that He's already mapped out for you. There's no point saying, I can do all things through Christ, when really all you're needing right now is to be comforted. Put the verse in the specific place that gives you the faith to continue for one more day. What's an example of that? Well, it's in Psalms 119 verse 50. This is my comfort. In my affliction, your word gives me hope. Or for the young person out there right now, that's struggling and overwhelmed with pornography or addiction or desires or inclinations or compulsions to perv and to lust and to be obsessed with females, then he's going to have to get his faith from Psalms 119 verse 9. How is a young man meant to cleanse his way? How is he meant to make his way pure? By taking heed according to the word of God. Oh, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Or you may need to go to Peter and it says, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. And he may need to dig into the Bible and understand what it means to abstain. It means to stay far away from. When it talks about a prostitute in the Bible, it says, avoid her street. But in the Hebrew it says, avoid it like a plague. That's what you put your faith in. The action and the belief specifically to the need that you're struggling with or the need that you're wanting God to fulfill in your life. Is that clear? So let's just... Go to... The Gospel of John, as they would call it, the Synoptic Gospel, theologically speaking. <laughs> so, John, chapter 20. And verse 24. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and my finger into the print of the nails, and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's a very powerful statement. We're talking about someone that has actually walked with Jesus. Been with Jesus 
for the last three years and this man that's been with Jesus chooses willfully to not believe. Don't you think that's crazy? Do you know Jesus bumped into people's beliefs all the time? Do you know when Jesus bumps into your belief, it may offend you? Because you think it's okay to believe what you're believing in, and Jesus says, well, it's not if you expect this result, and you choose to believe here instead. So here's doubting Thomas. And it says, after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Verse 27, then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, look at my hands, reach your hand here, put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. Be believing, Thomas. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed. Someone say blessed. Are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that believing you may have life in his name. Believing that you have life in his name. Guys, there's life in believing. There's life in believing, which means there's no life in disbelief. So maybe where you're stuck right now, where life is not generated from the Holy Spirit, is because you're choosing to be in disbelief. The good news for every single person here today is that you can actually take the Word of God today in your disbelief and say, Lord, I choose to believe. Faith doesn't need two years of restoration before it can believe again. You can believe right here, right now, even if you walked in disbelief this morning. That is the blessing of what we can have in Christ. And we believe against the disbelief of us being a failure. We believe in us being loved even though we don't feel loved. We believe in God's goodness even though we don't see goodness. I'm not talking pie in the sky, I'm talking steak on a plate. I lost my niece, born dead. And I believe that God was going to resurrect that little baby from the dead. It was absolutely devastating. And my spirit was grieving. And I remember sitting in the car and the pain would not leave my heart. And I trusted God even though I felt the pain. But I tell you what actually removed the grief was when I said in the car, I don't understand why this has happened. And this is half the reason we get stuck in disbelief. Because we don't understand. God's not wanting you to understand. He's just wanting you to say, believe in me despite what you don't understand. 
I said, I don't understand why this has happened, but what I do, get this, what I do understand is that you've been good to me. What I do understand is that you are good. And I'm telling you the truth, the grief literally disappeared instantly while I was sitting in the car. Do you know your belief, if it changes to the right belief and goes to the right place when you communicate with God, it can actually remove something that's been sitting there for years. <laughs> Come on, that grief was not leaving because I was still reasoning why. Are you here today thinking, why is this thing not leaving? Why is it hanging around? When's it ever going to leave? It may be that you're actually believing the wrong thing. Or your mindset needs to change, your perspective needs to change for your faith in Christ and the anointing to be activated to give you the strength to continue the journey that you know that you need to embark on. And the more we do this, it strengthens the belief system and who you are in Christ. And it wouldn't matter what comes against you, what is in you is unshakable. It's unmovable. 86 times God said to the children of uh, Israel, Remember that I brought you out of slavery. Remember that my right arm stretched out, my power stretched out to you and drew you out with many signs and wonders. Why was God saying remember 86 times? Because he wanted to get rid of a mentality, a slavery mentality, out of their thinking completely into a belief in his goodness that without him, without his power, they were never coming out of slavery. Without his power, they were never going to walk into the promises that God ordained for them to have. You know, 2 Timothy says uh, 1... Six, we've heard this before, haven't we? Um, Timothy, I remind you. Or I bring to remembrance in the old King James, just for those old King James fans. I see some smiles. He says, I bring to remembrance, I remind you. See, what we do is we try harder. We think that striving in our understanding gets the results God wants us to have, and it's not true. If Christianity is constantly white-knuckling and trying harder and just trying to get through and it's hard work, there's something missing in our belief. It's an insight that's missing to give you access into spiritual understanding. Because this word remembrance or I remind you, someone say ena memnisco. For the Greek scholars, please forgive me. But that's what it looks like. Someone say that's what it looks like. Mark's just the messenger. He's an Aboriginal German. Give him grace. He's not a Greek scholar. Come on, loosen up a bit, people. Gee, you know, like, you think God's up there miserable, like, you know, just sitting there biting his fingernails and, you know, just stressing and wrinkled up. And sometimes I think we're, we think God's like, yeah, real serious. Hey, like, when I look at you, I know he's not serious. <laughs> 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 I 
sometimes we feel bad because like, oh, I can be happy in church. <laughs> you got to be all ooh, somber and serious, pious, <laughs> stoic. <laughs> yes, our father. <laughs> <laughs> like God's a killjoy joy or something. <laughs> like you're the joyful one and God's the one you go to and you've got to be all serious. Like you, you love more than him or something. That you're more happy than him or something. <laughs> oh God, you know, if I was you, I'd do all this. It's like, wow. Since when do you care more than what he does? Wow, man, we just get so messed up, don't we? Like, like you're kinder than God or something. Trust me, you're not. You're not kinder than God. And I know that sometimes you don't see kindness the way he sees it, but trust me, he's kinder than you. And I know this because how kind are you to yourself? Because I can tell you this, if you're not kind to yourself, guess who's a lot kinder to you? He's a lot more kinder to you than what you are of yourself. Because what we usually do is we condemn ourselves and we put ourselves down and we think we're a disqualification. And See, he's kinder just in that one aspect. Because, because that kindness says, get up, when everyone else says they're never going to get up again. That kindness says... You've got this when you think you've got nothing at all. That kindness says, start running and believing again. When you say, I've got no reason to get up and run and believe again. See, that kindness is, is, is upon you every day. He is the most beautiful person I've ever met in my life. Are we talking about God like creator up there? No, no. He is the most beautiful person that I've ever met. Do you know, when he's revealed himself to me, do you know he's revealed himself to me in face-to-face -face encounters? Not face-to-face -face in like I've seen him personally, but face-to-face -face in the way he's manifested himself to me. I've actually felt his eyes staring at me. I've actually seen his eyes manifest to me. I've actually felt how intense his love is towards me. And it's far beyond what we think it is. So it's very hard for me to talk about him as though he's not the most beautiful person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> There's only one person that I've ever met a human being that has actually manifested that same love. One night I walked up to him, he turned around and he said, I love you, and I knew it was the Holy Spirit. See, love to us is not the same as him. Love keeps no record of. Love always believes. It always hopes. Love never fails. Wow. Is this okay? You sure? I'm trying to be nicer. So when we look at Hebrews 12 too, it says he's the author. He's the pioneer. He's the originator of a school of thought in the Greek. In one translation, it says he's the groundbreaker. Do you know he's the groundbreaker of what you believe? He's the groundbreaker. Do you know right now he's breaking open people's beliefs right now? Just by the word. Just by the word being preached right now, he's breaking open a realm of himself in faith to you, that you believe in him. He's the author. He's the finisher. He's the pioneer. He's the groundbreaker. He's the originator of a school of thought. He's the one. We believe in him and he breaks open in us what we need to get to know God more and to live the way God wants us to live. Well, I don't want to continue on, but I just can I just quickly pray and then So Father, we just thank you today for activating our faith. Believing right now. 
believing right now in Jesus' name. Thank you that faith is alive in this atmosphere. We can give ourselves to you completely. Thank you that you're faithful when we're not. Thank you that you're good when life is not good. Thank you for providing when things financially are going backwards. Thank you that you'll never, ever leave us nor forsake us. Thank you that we are more than conquerors today. We have a surpassing victory. We win the battle before we even fight it. I thank you for every person here today, Father, for an impartation in their spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. Let their spirit come alive in the mighty name of Jesus. Removing every blockage in the mighty name of Jesus. Removing the blockages, removing the hindrances, removing the limitations, removing the restrictions in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that your fire burn in our spirit for the gospel. Burning for you, Lord Jesus. Burning for the kingdom. On fire for the things of God. Lord, I pray every person to take everything from you this morning that would receive the blessings of Christ, would receive the joy of the Spirit, the power of God, who the God of the breakthrough, the God of miracles, the God of signs and wonders, the God that makes a way where there is no way. We thank you, Lord. You're the God of the impossible. Thank you, Lord, that everything is aligning even over this church in this season. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are loyal to this church. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the head of this church. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the transition of this season for this church. Thank you, Lord, for the realignment. Thank you, Lord, for the reestablishing. Thank you, Lord, for the direction that you're taking this church in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for Neil and Nancy. Times of refreshing coming from the presence of the Lord upon their life in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, as they wait upon you, that they're renewing their strength. They're filling their mouth with good things so that their youth is renewed like the eagle in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. On the outside, they may look older, but in the inside, they're getting younger. And I want to say thank you, Lord. I declare not just over this church, but I declare over Neil and Nancy. It's a season of restoration. It's a season of miracles. It's a season of signs and wonders. It's a season of overflow and provision and miracles upon miracles in the mighty name of Jesus. And what the devil tried to do for evil, Father, we thank you that you're turning it around for good in the mighty name of Jesus. You're turning it around. Oh, the God of the turnaround. This is what I feel, Neil, the God of the turnaround. Who the God of the turnaround. I see you two standing on the mountain, not in the valley. I see you standing on the mountain top. Ooh. If you want prayer this morning, you want some prayer this morning, just come out the front here. We'll just pray with you. We'll believe God with you. We'll just, uh, but other than that, God bless you. There's a cup of coffee at the back. But if you want a touch from God, just come. Come, come, come right now in Jesus' name. Come.